We are on part three this morning of a three-part sermon series on anxiety. It's called Anxious for Nothing. Brief review. Two weeks ago, the first sermon, do you remember this? It was called, Why So Anxious, O My Soul, from Psalm 42. We learned that anxiety thrives on uncertainty. Which, oddly enough, those are the very things we usually use to comfort ourselves. Like, oh, I'm sure things will get better, maybe. Or, I'm sure it'll improve. Or, COVID's going to last like the end of April, you know. Well, just makes you more anxious, is it? I don't know. And then when it doesn't happen, oh man, what is it going to stop, huh? Rather than thriving on, ang- on uncertainty, what we do to drive out anxiety is we turn to certainty. And there's nothing more certain than your Savior's promises for you. Which, that's last week's sermon, right? The anti-anxiety God. It was an evening where the disciples were very anxious because they just found out Jesus is going to be betrayed, falsely arrested, accused, killed on a cross. We're going to be left behind. We're anxious. And what does Jesus do? He gives them certain promises like, my father's house are many rooms. If that weren't so, I would have told you. I'm going there to prepare a place for you, and when I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back to bring you to be with me where I am. Promises like, because you live, because I live, you also will live. Promises like, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Promises like, peace I give you. My peace, that is God's peace, I send to you. And so today's sermon is kind of like the what now. It's the application of those two truths, right? We're going to kind of apply that message to ourselves. How do we battle anxiety on a day-to-day basis? I think it's important because anxiety can attack just like that, right? For example, earlier this week, Monday morning, it's like 8 a.m., all right? which is less than 24 hours after I preached the sermon called The Anti-Anxiety God. I get an email. Some of you know this. We're very close to being able to go down to Columbia to get our daughter down there, adopted daughter down there. So I get an email that says, hey, there's a humanitarian flight there accepting adoptive parents onto this. All you have to do is fill out the correct forms and get it in and you might make it. After reading that subject title, it takes no more than about three seconds for my heart to start beating very quickly, and my mind to start racing. Like, how quickly do I need to fill this out? Do I have enough time? I gotta get to my email and I gotta go quickly. Um, what are all the words on here? They're in Spanish, I don't always know Spanish. Here, it says that I need to enter the Salida. According to Google Translate, Salida means exit, but are you sure? They're not asking me about my favorite place to get lettuce. Um, I gotta get downtown, I gotta get to the Apostille place. The Apostille, it's where they give the nice symbol that says that it has been notarized by the notary correctly. I gotta get down there. Are they open? They're only open on Mondays, according to this time. Oh, I hopefully I call, I can sweet talk them to make sure that I get there, and let's not get COVID while we're down there to extend the entire thing. I'll get it. I'll make it happen. And then afterwards, what if uh, I send it in and I didn't notarize the notary correctly and the notarized didn't notarize it correctly. And I'm saying the word notary so many times are they going to be obnoxious and they're not going to listen to me because I'm so obnoxious. Like my mind starts racing and I say, you know what? What if we do all this and we don't get on the flight? I'm anxious. Are we? Am I going to be ready for worship this weekend? Or what if we do all this work and I do get on the flight? Am I going to be ready to be a dad? And anxiety attacks and anxiety wins after the pastor just preached a sermon about the anti-anxiety God. How do we battle anxiety, practically speaking, on a day-to-day basis? God's Word has some tips for us. Godly advice, right? Before we dig into this section from Philippians chapter 4, let us say a prayer and let's ask God to bless us. Oh Lord, strengthen us this morning by the truth. Your Word is the truth. 
Open our eyes to see what you want us to see. Open our ears to hear what you want us to hear. And open our hearts to believe what you, O Lord, would have us believe. Amen. It's Philippians chapter 4, and I think Philippians chapter 4, verses 4 through 7 are tailor-made for dealing with anxiety. Look at verse 4 first. It says, Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice. Let me give you some backstory on this verse. Philippians is a letter that was written to a group of believers in Philippi. So it's like if someone were writing a letter to us here in Raleigh, Raleighans, right? Durhaminians. So this letter is written to the group of believers in Philippi. It's written by a guy named Paul who is the pastor there. But do you know where Paul is when he writes this letter? He is under house arrest. You see, he's been falsely accused, falsely convicted. He appeals to Caesar. He gets shipped away from his home, away from his family, away from the people that he knows, to the city of Rome itself, where he's placed under house arrest. He can't leave. It's like quarantine. For two years. Can't go where he wants. Can't do what he wants. Stuck at home. When I hear that scenario, I think to myself, well, there's not a lot of very good things going on for Paul at this moment in his life. But in the midst of those moments, in the midst of that scenario, what does he say? Take a look. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice. How is he able to do that? You're under house arrest, dude. A couple notes. Take a look at the first one, right? What does he say? He says, rejoice in the Lord. For Paul, the reality was there wasn't a lot of reason to rejoice in house arrest. There wasn't a lot of reason to rejoice in Roman-imposed quarantine. Honestly, when life's not going great, sometimes your expectations for reasons to rejoice gets lowered during COVID. Hasn't that happened? Right as you're at home and you're quarantined and you say, well, I'm going to rejoice and the things you're rejoicing about, they aren't as impressive as they used to be. Like maybe you say, rejoice in this word search that I finished. Or rejoice. I got the high score on Yahtzee on my phone. Or rejoice. They got a new season of the Umbrella Academy just came out. Or rejoice. I helped my kids with their homework. And the teacher gave us a B minus. When it doesn't seem like you have a lot of reason to rejoice maybe in your life and in the things going on here, Paul reminds us, well, you really do. Maybe instead of rejoicing in this over here, though, you take a step over to this circle and you rejoice in the Lord. There's always reason to rejoice in the Lord. Why? Because in the Lord, there's forgiveness. Rejoice in the Lord, there's peace. Rejoice in the Lord. You have eternal life. Rejoice in the Lord. You are bound for heaven. Rejoice in the Lord. Jesus is with you. Rejoice in the Lord. God has your back. Rejoice in the Lord. You will get through whatever struggle you're going through. Which maybe combos with our next key point, that word there, rejoice. It's a verb. It's an action word. That's important to note because I think when I've looked at this verse in the past, I see it as if Paul is saying, feel, feel happy, feel joyful. Like, he's, like God is commanding us an, to have an emotion. Which, parents, how well does that work? Like if your kid is having a meltdown, if your kid is screaming and crying, how well does it work to command their emotions? Hey, feel happy. <laughs> Be happy. Doesn't work. God is not commanding us to have an emotion. He's commanding an action. Not feel joyful, but rejoice. You see, God commands us this, this action of rejoicing even and despite our feelings. What's that look like? Well, it looks like worshiping. Singing a favorite hymn. Turn on your favorite worship station. It, it looks like 
saying prayers to your God. It looks like taking your kids aside, talking about Jesus. It looks like smiling just because Jesus loves you. And here is the genius thing about this, right? The genius of God, which that's an understatement, right? The genius of God. Here's the genius of God. As we take those joyful actions, you tend to feel better, right? Smiling triggers things in your brain even, some kind of a connection. You feel better. Which is why, by the way, the last point in that verse, right? Rejoice in the Lord always. See the always. Because it's not commanding an emotion, but commanding an action, this is something that you can do even when you feel at your worst. Like rejoice in the Lord. When you get a job promotion and when you lose your job. Rejoice in the Lord. When you're healthy and sick, rejoice in the Lord when relationships are good and when they're bad. Rejoice in the Lord when you're feeling terrified or when you're feeling content. Rejoice in the Lord when you're in need and when you have plenty. Rejoice in the Lord always. He says, I will say it again, rejoice, and I'm going to say it again. Rejoice in the Lord always. Rejoice. Got it? All right, that's like our secret weapon against anxiety, number one, stopping and rejoicing. Number two, verse five. Let your gentleness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. Bible trivia for the day, the word gentleness there, the Bible's originally written in Greek, and the Greek word there for gentleness is epiekes. Epiekes. It's a verb, it means to be submissive or to, to allow, to permit. Which is really odd when you're talking about anxiety because when anxiety hits me, I tend to attack it back. Like, I want that anxious thing to stop. What can I do to make it stop? What can I do to improve this situation? What do I need to do to make sure that that doesn't happen? Like instead of sitting back and taking it in, we fight. To illustrate this another way, do you guys, anybody ever used a pinball machine before? You played pinball before? Yeah. So here's the pinball, right? And it's bouncing around on the different bumpers. And then it starts to make its way down to the little flippy thingies. That's the technical term right there. So, okay, how do you approach that? Well, if you're a pinball player, you might do this, right? You can hold the buttons, and it causes the flippy things to stay up, and then the ball kind of comes down the curve and the angle, and then it comes to rest nice and gently. Gentleness. But there's another way that you can play pinball. It's my preference. And that is to mash the buttons as quickly as you can so that as soon as it hits it, it goes flying off in the other direction. The velocity increases and you're bouncing back and forth between the bumpers faster than before. All the lights, all the sounds, I like it. It's my ADD, right? Guess what? Here's what God says when it comes to anxiety, right? When it comes to anxiety, be gentle because it prevents anxiety from building up within yourself. It says, be gentle with your words and your actions even when you're feeling anxious because if you're not... If you're gruff, if you're kind of mean, if you raise your voice, you know what happens? Well, maybe I get on my email, it says, hey, boss wants to meet with you. Makes me kind of anxious. I don't know what he wants to meet about. So I feel anxious. And when my wife asks me what I want for supper, I'm kind of snappy with her because I'm feeling anxious. And then she says to me, well, this, you're not being very nice. And I feel a little bit more anxious because she's probably right, and I don't want to be that way. And so I raise my voice a little bit more, and then here come the kids around the corner, and I see them, and I think to myself, oh, no, they think I'm a bad father. I'm anxious about that. So I make my way out the door to the car, kind of slam it as I get in, and I'm pulling down the driveway, and who should be across the street waving at me gently but my neighbor, wondering if he should call the police or not, right? And now I start to go, oh, no, he... He probably thinks I'm a bad neighbor. 
and I get to work, and I'm anxious about all these different things, so I miss the five or six people who greet me on the way in, and they all think that I'm grumpy, and later when that dawns on me, I say, now everyone probably thinks I'm a grump here. And anxiety that started down here is now piled upon, right? It's been built up. Rather, God says, be gentle. Even when you're Feeling on edge, stay gentle with your words. It will prevent the anxiety from building up for yourself and also for others. Like if I say this phrase in two different ways, you're going to feel a little bit different. Imagine we're at work and I come up to you and I say, hey, friend. There was a, a mistake on this report. Or, hey, there's a mistake on that report. Question, which one causes you more anxiety? Number two, right? Like when we're gruff, when we're mean with our words, when we lose it, right? It, it, there's an edge to it. We're only building anxiety up for others. God says don't do that, right? Because all it will do is make them more anxious and then possibly they're going to build the anxiousness back to themselves and bring it back to you and then it's one old big old ball of anxiety. Instead, God says be gentle. And he gives some gospel encouragement at the end of the verse. Did you see this? Be gentle. Why? Because God is near. Friends, whatever's making you anxious, your God is with you. He's got it. I mean, before you even realized your anxiety, he looked down from heaven before we were even in existence and he saw the greatest cause of anxiety, which is sin and guilt and shame in our heart. And God said, I'm going to do something about it. And so he came down from heaven. He lived perfectly, died innocently, rose triumphantly for you. He removed all of your sin, which means he's near in a way unlike any nearness before. Sin is not in his way. God's near. Don't be afraid. Don't be anxious. Be gentle. Following so far, we got two. Two secret weapons. Number one, rejoice. Number two, stay gentle. Be gentle. Practice gentleness, right? Here comes number three. Do not worry about anything, but in everything... By prayer and petition with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Helps us to identify the word prayer there. There's a synonym after that. Did you see that? Syn synonym, not cinnamon. I think I said cinnamon. <laughs> There's a word that means the same thing. Okay. <laughs> By prayer and petition, what's a petition? Well, a petition, nowadays you sign a piece of paper, right, and you try to make change. Nowadays you do it on forms online, right? A petition, by the way, is the reason they're allowing adoptive families to go ahead now and, and board humanitarian flights down to Columbia. Petitions also kind of changed the way the Wake County is doing school, right? Petitions, they could, they could change for social justice. Petitions. But what do you do if the, the change that you want to make, what if the change you want to make is something personal? Like an anxiety in your life. Like what do you do? Who do you petition? Answer? God. Which is what prayer really is. That's what God's telling us, right? You're petitioning, you're saying, God, here's what I need help with. And here's the thing, when you petition God, God does not come back and say, okay, well, I'm going to need 500 more signatures in order to take you seriously. No. He listens. He hears. He loves you. And so we pray to God and we do it in all things. I think that's important. This isn't a brainstorm truth. But like if you're feeling anxious and you share it with someone else, like a friend or a family member, you tend to feel better, right? But when it comes to sinful human beings, there might be some things that you don't want to share with your family members and friends because you think, well, what would they think of me? Or how would they react? Or what kind of gossip will happen? Or can they be trusted? 
But here's what God says. Trust me. Whatever you're anxious about, share it with me. Whatever you're anxious about, uh, there's no condemnation here. I, I already took away your sin. The only thing you really needed to be anxious about, that's been removed. You are my forgiven child. Trust me. Pray to me in any situation. And it says this, by prayer and petition, present your requests with thanksgiving. Did you see that part? That's an interesting addendum to verse 6 there. I think of the Thanksgiving table. How many? We're close. When's Thanksgiving? November. How close is that? Three months. There you go. Three months till Thanksgiving. Picture yourself sitting at the Thanksgiving table. I know it's hot, but you're sitting at the Thanksgiving table, and there's that, that turkey uh, looking good. It's juicy. Got the flavor, steam coming out. A couple of different types of potatoes. This one's got cheese on it over here, mashed with the butter, melting in. There's that cranberry sauce. The green bean casserole with the little crispies. I love the little crispies on the top. You can could, you could see it in the oven. There's the, the pumpkin pie, bacon right next to the apple pie, next to the cherry pie, next to the pecan slash pecan slash whatever you want to call it pie. When you're sitting down for Thanksgiving meal, what, usually the first thing you say is not, I'm anxious if we're going to have enough. No. Here's the deal. Thanksgiving drives out anxiety. When you take a moment and you thank God for what he's given to you and you remember, look at all the things that he's given to me. It's in his hands. It's okay. I'm going to be all right. Like you fill your heart with Thanksgiving rather than anxiety. Practically speaking, here, here's what it looks like. Uh, a pastor taught me this, and I, th I think that is helpful. When you wake up in the morning, and you're doing maybe your morning Bible reading, your quiet time, you do a little devotion with God. Before you start, I try to write down five things that I'm thankful for from the day before. Okay? Like thankful for a beautiful wife, beautiful daughter, for the puppy that's licking my leg, for the cat that's batting my hand as I'm writing this, the bag of Doritos in the garbage, they were good, you know, all the above. Write them down. And then maybe you write down five things that are always true. Forgiveness, baptized into God's family, part of his kingdom, privilege to serve, peace with God. And now your day is starting filled with thankfulness. Way better than starting your day with five posts found on social media. No, terrible idea. Found, start your day with your God. Thankfulness. If your heart is filled with thankfulness, there's no room for anxiety, my friends. Right? Now it gets interesting. Because usually when we preach sermons, we end each sermon with the what now. Well, we just did three what nows, right? Rejoice, be gentle, be prayerful. Usually we end each sermon with a what now. We started this sermon with three what now, so how do we end? Well, the Apostle Paul continues in the next verse by giving another what now, but it's not for you. It's not for me. It's for God. Look at this verse. And the peace of God, which surpasses all, all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. For Paul, this was this concept of being guarded, that's familiar, right? He's under house arrest, which means there's Roman soldiers outside his door. On the one hand, they are preventing him from leaving. We talked about that. On the other hand, they are keeping other people from coming to attack him. So like if he hears a noise in the distance for Paul, he can look outside and he sees the soldiers there. He sees their chain mail and maybe a big old spear, the Roman scabbard sword, and he's like, oh, it'll be okay. God will send his peace to guard your heart. Like he's already been doing that. Makes me stop and think, what would that be like if I didn't have that promise? 
Like God sends his peace to guard your hearts. He sends his peace. He's doing it now in his word where he says, I love you. You are forgiven. You are a part of my family. You are my child. And he posts these little guards outside your heart to help battle anxiety. It means you don't have to battle anxiety alone. You battle it with the God of angel armies by your side. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Will, not might, will. Friends, as you go forth this week to battle anxiety, remember God is battling with you. He sends his peace to guard your hearts, and he's going to guard your hearts because God when says when he says he's going to do something, he does something. He wins the victory. He always wins the victory, and he will win the victory over anxiety for you. Amen.